On to the message, which is every bit as unusual as the walls of Jericho, if not more so, if you can imagine that. There's a story in the Bible that, well, it answers the question that all of us should ask. We'll be right there in a moment. But listen to this scripture. This is Jesus speaking after he does the parable of the sower. He says, is a lamp brought to be put under a bushel or a bed and not to be set on the lampstand? Seems logical enough. You don't purchase a lamp to put it somewhere in a drawer or in a closet. The obvious reason you purchase a lamp is to illuminate the room, to show light. But then it goes on to another scripture immediately following. And it says, there's nothing hidden which shall not be manifested. Neither is anything kept secret, but that it should come to light. Well, what does that mean? something is kept secret but then it's come to light what, what is jesus talking about what light could be kept secret and then it comes to light why is that in the bible interesting it must have an answer somewhere it's a riddle it's perplexing if you just read it on the first hand first he's saying you don't do you don't purchase a light unless you're going to put it on the lampstand then he tells you well you're going to have a light that you're going to hide but then it won't be hidden. Seems like a contradiction at first glance. In the book of Judges, there's all hell is breaking loose. Let's be frank. They keep disobeying God, and God uses foreign nations and enemy to thrash them, to torment them, to discipline them, to try to get them back to the center of their focus on God. Listen to that. God uses the enemy. He allows foreign nations to come in to abuse them, very frankly, to torment them. I mean that. Why? Why would God allow such? That's why people said, well, wait a second. The enemy's kicking my butt. What's going on here? I'm a child of God. And God allowed it in the Old Testament repeatedly in order to correct them and say, focus on me, guys. I'm the one who gave you life. I'm the one who turned you into a nation. Give me your full attention. Every time they would, he would bless them. Every time they got distracted, he would use this disciplinary, I mean, what a method. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Anyway, we come to the story of Gideon, and the nation is again in disobedience. You see, what Christians don't understand is that we have a mission. We are much better than what we look like. We are supposed to be amazing, and we're, we're charged to be amazing. We're charged to have testimonies and illumination of the earth just based on observing our lives. But because we don't take that mission at center stage like Israel and somehow or another put it to the side or make it secondary or, or even whatever, God calls it the Laodicean church. You're neither hot or cold. I wish you were either one, but this isn't working. This relationship is not going to function. That's what he says. We have an entire book to teach us this. Why? Why is it not working for me in my life? Why am I frustrated? Why don't I see the hand of God? Well, the story of Gideon is amazing. The Midianites have come in and stolen all of their prosperity. Get this for a strategy. Brilliant. They would let Israel year after year, seven years, farm the crops, grow the cattle, get the wheat, the wine, everything. And just at the moment of harvest, the Midianites would come in with hundreds of thousands of soldiers and just abscond with everything. That's it. It's ours now. Move over. And Israel would run for the hills, literally. That's where we are right now in this moment. That's where Christianity is. It's running for the hills. Virtually on this planet, where's the influence of Christianity? Let's be real. I say repeatedly, read the book of Acts. You see Christianity today and you must conclude there's something absolutely skewed. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. I repeat, a Christian was designed to be infinitely better than that. But, much to the surprise, if I were to ask you how many times the word Christian is in the Bible, some people, when I used to do this, would guess hundreds of times. It's in the Bible three times, twice spoken by unbelievers. Only three times. But the word disciple is everywhere in its form of disciple, of doing, of 
replicating Christ. It is all throughout the Bible. We have the wrong idea of Christianity. So Israel finds itself in this position. They're weakened. They're suffering. They don't have the promise of God manifested. An angel shows up and calls Gideon something he could never believe. Oh, mighty man of God, you are brave and courageous and powerful. Gideon looks up and goes, huh? Who are you talking to? And the angel bestows a declaration over him. Gideon finally comes to himself. And he says something that's profound that every Christian should ask if they're not walking in victory. And I mean that. Because you're not designed to walk in defeat. That's not your lot because you did this. No, you should say, wait a minute, why is it wrong? Why am I not experiencing the promises of the Bible? Here it goes. So he says this, oh, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon immediately replies, what a question. Hey, if the Lord is with me, then where are all the miracles and why is all this nonsense happening to me? Finally, someone asked the right question. Well, wait a second, God, if I'm a Christian, if I'm your son or daughter, why am I in this lot that I'm in? Why is this occurring to me? Why? Tell me, where are the miracles that I read about in the book of Acts? Why is in my shadow healing anybody? Tell me what's wrong. Finally, someone in the Bible asked the right question. Where are all the miracles? Didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? They're referring to those miracles, the plagues, the Red Sea, where now the Lord has forsaken us. Imagine, it's like the book of Malachi, God, you don't love me. Imagine, where's God? He left us. I no longer have God. He doesn't care about me anymore. What a horrible thing to say. And you've delivered us into the hands of the enemy, the Midianites. The Lord looks at him, doesn't answer one word of this nonsense conversation. Remember Joshua? Are you for me or against me? God doesn't answer these stupid questions, but he is going to answer the question, where are the miracles? And here's the answer. Listen, hear it with an open ear gate. How can I get a miracle? Here's your answer. Listen carefully. Go in this thy might, and you shall deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? That's a stern rebuke. Where are my miracles? What? Well, why am I oppressed? What? You expect me to answer that nonsense? Go in your power. Didn't I send you to go? Why haven't you gone? There's the answer. Christianity was designed to be, it says, go into all the world. We're designed to be a going church, an aggressive church, a marching forward church. When that church arises, that's going to say, Satan, I'm going to kick your ass from here to kingdom come. When that church arises and say, we're going to empty hospitals, that's the church. This is not church. This is some sort of spectator sport. It's not church. What you see in this world is not church. It is, it is absolutely not what God designed. And we've conformed to this false image of weakness. And it, it's pathetic. I was talking to someone the other day, and I was like, man, I, I'll be honest with you, I did go on a rant because they started talking to me about some new virus. And I'm going, what in heaven? Not again. Really, you're going to do this again? Where the hell is your faith? Where's your power? What do you think? The apostle Peter's going, whoa, somebody got a mask somewhere? Are you crazy? His shadow was raising the dead. Come on. Why are these stories in the Bible? I, I don't want to go on my rant now, but I, but I do want to go on my rant, but I will not go on my rant. So God tells him, what is wrong with you? Go in your power. Didn't I send you to go in your power? But since you're here like a coward hiding behind something, what the heck do you expect to do? Why don't you stand up and be who you're supposed to be? You're going to do it in your power. Holy smokes. We've come a long way, baby. That's some, like, 30 years ago. Ooh. I'm going to now fast forward the story because it's a number of chapters, and I want to get to the point of this point. A lot of things transpire, and God now is giving him his command to go and liberate Israel. 
32,000 men show up and God looks at the army and goes, this is never going to work. Watch this. So he says, the people that are with you are way too many for me to give the enemy into your hands. What? You got to hear that. Listen, so many people have too much stuff that God just can't do it. Too much reliance on education, too much reliance on friends or money. When I get this business, when I do this, when I get healed, too much reliance on other than what's God. And so God says, I'm not going to do that for you. You're going to think because you became a medical doctor that that's why you're successful. No, I'm not, I'm not cooperating. You're going to think because you, you, know, you do whatever you do. No, this is about me. You have to come and focus in on me and I will take care of everything for you. Gideon has been hiding for a long time before these words and nothing has happened because God has a principle in the Bible. He takes these situations and turns them for good. Perhaps you've been hid. Perhaps you're hiding. Perhaps you just consider yourself normal, obscure. You're just a common folk walking down the street somewhere in some city. You're just normal like everybody else, you think, because nothing has happened yet, because you haven't manifested yet because God is processing you and you think it's never going to happen. I'm not Esther. I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm just a common person. I'm going to live a common life. Like hell you are, you're not going to live a common life. If you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are designed for something far more than what you can imagine right now. It's just like David. David gets the anointing and he's hit for almost 20 years. Joseph gets the coat of many colors and nothing happens. In prison, imprisoned, that's what happens. Moses is called of God and knows it. And he's 40 years in the desert. Thank God that's all Old Testament, but the principle is more than valid. Sometimes God takes the most valuable pearls, the most valuable gold twice refined, and hides it for a season to break that you'll see in a moment, to break that vessel so that the glory would be his. But then the time comes where the person responds and stops making excuses, stops looking for alternatives, stops trying to figure it out, and just says to the Lord, I'm here, use me. I give you my life in totality. I belong to you. Do as you wish. That release is what releases the anointing, the breaking of the vessel. We'll see it in a minute. The people are too many. Send them away. They go away. I'm skipping the details. He st uh, says the people are still too many. There's 10,000 left. Too many. Send them away. Get rid of them with a device. We're not discussing that now. They go away. He's left with 300 men out of 32,000. Think of the percentage. Facing hundreds of thousands of soldiers. The odds are impossible. That's what God was trying to get through. I want it to be impossible so I can get my glory. God wants you to have impossible situations that you think you can't get out of. You think this is going to be my ending. Your ending, that's your beginning. You just need to see how God works. Stop thinking it's over. It ain't over. It's starting. Really. Gideon obeys. Imagine the man. He must be thunderstruck. You got a, a decent sized army, 32,000 is nothing to sneeze at. We might get lucky. Maybe we'll all die, but we're going to take some of them down. It may be a noble battle. God says, no, you're left with 300. That's it. But then is where it gets peculiar, unless we know the Bible. Remember the scripture, hide it to show it. He gives them instructions that are quite unique. I want you to get a torch. I want you to get a trumpet. I'd like for you to have a pitcher, a vessel. And I'd like for you to follow my instructions. And Gideon tells the men, do exactly as I do. My God, if a church will do exactly what God tells them to do. I've seen more people healed and delivered. I mean this in so many locations, the moment they decided to be obedient. 
The moment they decided not to get a better idea or modify God's idea like King Saul, the moment, the instant that they said, you know what, I'm tired of being sick and tired. I'm fed up with this. I'm going to do exactly what God tells me to do, and let's see what happens. Miracles happen. Let me tell you right now. Miracles happen for crying out loud. But to get a person there, oh, Bamiya, that's the miracle. It's like pulling on a herd of elephants. Listen to the instructions. He gives a trumpet to every man, a pitcher to every man, an empty one, and then, listen, the fire, the torch. And he says, look on me. This is Jesus talking. And do likewise. And when, do, when I come to the outside of the camp, do exactly as I do. Don't, don't deviate one iota. Now, this is very interesting, and this is where it gets a little complex if you don't know the Bible, but everybody got their trumpet. Everyone had their torch. Everyone had their vessel. This is not some sort of superstar mentality. This is everybody. This is not King Saul and Jonathan. What a sad story. They're the only ones with weaponry. They're the only ones that had swords. The entire congregation was left without a sword, depending on these two schmucks. And guess what happens? They both get killed and people start getting beheaded because they had no head. That's why there were heads cut off, signifying they did not have headship over them. But here in this story, Gideon, no. Everybody is going to preach the gospel. Everyone is going to have the torch. Everybody is going to do a miracle. Everyone is going to have that power. Just follow Jesus Christ and do what he did. That's all it says. Please, ladies, gentlemen, please. The problems you think you have are not as large as you think. It's that you've made your God way smaller than what he really is. And the moment you believe God is big enough that you have to obey him, because if you don't obey God, he is not a big God to you. Stop fooling yourself. Stop having an unrealistic expectation. Because again, if an uh, authority figure you respected, the president, the CEO of something, or a mentor that you highly respect, and he asks you to do something, out of that respect, that honor, you would do whatever they asked you to do. If the police chief came in here with all his regalia and another hundred policemen and they asked us, could everyone move to the right, you wouldn't sit there resisting. Out of honor, respect, yes sir, yes ma'am, by all means, can we do anything for you? You would immediately obey because there's this something, whatever it is in relationship, that regards and respects and acknowledges who that person is. I mean, simply a sports figure. Pick your favorite. If you were to walk in here, you'd stand up, you'd want his autograph, you'd get him a chair, you'd sit him down. Can I get you a hamburger? There's something that transpires in a real life relationship. For you to say to God when he's giving you these instructions, most people don't even know them, be honest. But when you do know them, somehow or another we equivocate, or we do something. What do we do? I don't know, compromise? What do we do? Make it lesser? massage it to our liking and then we wonder why it doesn't work we wouldn't do that with a respected one obey the vessel is your temple it needs to be broken it needs to break in that pride and arrogance it's a broken and contrite heart that god cannot resist a humble spirit that bows its head and looks down and not up and asks God meekly and quietly, how can I please you? Give me the grace, the strength to make you strong in the eyes of others. That spirit that breaks is what causes anointing to flow. It, what causes the light that's inside a torch, a flaming beacon of power and light the Holy Spirit of God inside of you that's begging to get out. But the doorway is obedience and humility, a brokenness that says, I will dominate my flesh. I will break that sin and I will serve my master. 
that's what caused the breaking of the vessel. And then the torch, of course, as I just said, is the illumination of the anointing, the Shekinah glory of God resident in each and every child of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? But then the trumpet. The beauty of going back to the walls of Jericho, we didn't touch on it, it's for a future explanation, was that the walls came down when they blew the horns. The horns that came out of a dead animal. They would blow those horns, signifying the preaching of the gospel. And it's when they did that and shouted that the walls came down. And here's the same thing. Facing an innumerable army they could never defeat. An impossibility that was clear. It was obvious. But they obeyed. 300 men did what they had to do. Christian, break some vessels. Some vessels in this room are watching. It's time we break. It's time we stop resisting. It's time we start dancing around the issues and ask the question, God, why don't I have my miracle? If you saved Israel the way you did, and they were your servants, and I am your daughter or son, where are the miracles? Where's the God from that day, supposedly bigger this day? Where are you, God? Why am I in this mess? Why don't I have gratification? Why am I so broken and sad? Why does nothing work like the dreams I used to have? Why have I given up? Where are you? Tell me. Ask the right question, and then receive the instructions. I repeat, break your vessel. Be humble. Obey your God. He's not a man. He's God. And then you will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it will be resplendent, radiant, something you've never experienced before. But then there's a requirement. Oh, that trumpet. Oh, how you have to speak of Jesus wherever you go. Oh, how you have to overcome shyness and hesitancy and out of the boldness of the power. Oh, Jesus, I want to tell you about my Savior wherever you go. May I pray for you because my God will deliver you. May I tell you my story of how he healed me. Can I invite you to a concert or a church? Can I come to your home? Can I zoom in? Can I call you in Italy or Russia? You'll see. It's when they did this, they did not have to lift a finger. The gospel confounds darkness. You don't fight with darkness. You don't argue with darkness. You just simply turn the light on, and the darkness flees instantly. If only you would do this. They did, and the enemy devoured itself and ran away. Listen, the enemy is terrified of you, but not if you won't use the power of God. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not terrified of you. He's terrified of the gospel. If you will do that, the enemy, you think you have to fight him? <laughs> How silly. The enemy will run for the hills. The Bible says to draw near to God. Resist the devil by drawing near to God. And the Bible promises that he will flee, running so far away from you, you never knew he was even there. The gospel works. The gospel is not a tall story. You see, the light was hid inside that vessel that it would be shown and manifest. It's the scripture from Mark. Lights that were initially hidden inside of vessels, but the moment they broke, the moment they became trumpeteers, shouting the gospel of God, singing and dancing to one God, confessing before everyone one name. He saw it. He heard it. He knows. 
he's proud, he's happy, and he's looking for individuals that he can show himself strong. Tell him, Lord, I'm here. Use me. My vessel is broken. I will take direction. I will follow your orders. Give me the fire inside of me and give me that trumpet sound, a distinct sound, not stupid clanging cymbals that make no sense. Oh no, I will preach the word of Jesus Christ.